Hello, friend. Thank you for pressing play on this episode of the Brassy Broadcast. I'm Jen, the head brought in charge at the Brassy Broadcasting Company. My guest in this final installment of the Leveraging Your Voice to Grow Your Business podcast series is Jen Hemphill. Jen is a money confidence coach and an accredited financial counselor. She is also the host of the Her Money Matters podcast and the author of Her Money Matters, The Missing Truths from Traditional Money Advice. Jen shares why podcasting is such a powerful medium for her to share her message, how her new book came about as a result of her podcast, and how podcasting was a key component of her book launch strategy. As always, you can check the show notes for links to any resources mentioned. And I'll be back after our conversation to share some of my big takeaways. Enjoy my conversation with Jen Hemphill. Jen Hemphill, welcome to the Brassy Broadcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm so excited you're here because I love when I get to talk to fellow podcasters. And I love hearing your your different uh, video or hearing. I also watch them too. (laughs) With the different music renditions, they're so much fun. (laughs) I love it. Oh, good. Thank you. Let's jump right in and talk podcasting. Tell us about your podcast, Her Money Matters. Sure. My podcast, Her Money Matters, I've been doing this podcast, oh my goodness, almost three years uh, in June. And I, the reason behind why I decided to do that podcast was I had been in business for a couple of years and I needed to provide content to my audience, which at that time I was failing miserably because I had a blog, but in my first year, I didn't even make it to 12 blog posts. And so I lacked a lot of consistency in providing free content to my audience. So I knew right offhand, writing was not for me in terms of that consistent, you know, weekly or monthly or whatever scheduled writing because I'm a perfectionist and I wanted to get it right. I wanted to get it sound right. So it took me forever to get that one blog post. So I was exploring other options. I did YouTube videos, but then the lighting. We move around a lot as a military family. And then it was trying to figure out the correct lighting. (laughs) Uh And that was difficult. Lighting inside is just a tricky thing, Uh, especially if you don't have the natural lighting coming from outside the windows or you want to record a video maybe in the evening. So I got sick of that. And then I discovered podcasting and I was like, okay, this is what I can do. Because one, I love talking. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to write, well, yeah, I can outsource the uh, show notes. And so what I decided to do before I committed, I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I know myself, I didn't want to do the editing because again, my perfectionism comes into play and I didn't want to spend four, five, six hours editing one episode. So right off the bat, bat, I made the commitment that if I was going to do podcasting, that I was going to commit to outsourcing the editing piece. So that was very, very important to me. So once I made the decision and uh, just overcame the fears, will I have enough content? Because once you start planning, you can come up that you can become so creative. And as you talk to more guests, it just flows. It just it, you just you never run out of content or up to this point. I felt like I haven't had, you know, I haven't stressed o- over, oh, my goodness, what's going to be my next podcast? It's always flows. So that's a do you create a content calendar and and try to stick to that or how do you how do you structure that? So basically with my podcast, how I do my podcast, I do a combination of I do guests, so I do interview guests, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to just stick to a, being a guest pot or a, just a strictly guest interviewing guests. Mm-hmm. So I also because I get questions from my audience, I do solo episodes where I teach, basically, I answer their questions, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe sometimes it's not even answering questions, maybe it's something teaching them or what I've learned. For example, recently, I released an episode on how we were a one car family for seven years, right? So this is a family of four, and the lessons that we learn all those things. So sometimes it's teaching uh, about that. And other times, so with my guests, there's two types of guests that I interview. So I interview experts in the field of finance, 
Uh, so I, I am in the field of finance, but I don't know everything. So I bring experts to fill those gaps in the areas that I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then I also bring in uh, just guests where they, we just chat, like I could have, you know, I would love to have you where we just uh, chat on money stories, like, oh, how we grew up around money. Cause my aud- audience loves that. Cause what they crave, my audience craves is connection, being able yes. to relate to someone, being able to know that, you know what? Someone else has had the same challenges. Someone else has goofed up like they have, so they're not alone. And so those type of uh, interviews allows uh, me to give that to my, provide that to my audience. So it's just a very laid back interview. What were your challenges? How did you grow up? What have you, what mistakes have you made? What have you learned? What great things um, can you share with us? Those type of things. And they're just a lot of fun to do. So those are how I structure my podcast. So it's not... I plan quarterly uh, with my episodes, but planning meaning and this is this is really <laughs> simple how I do it. The planning means is what pod because since I do I interview my guests once a month. I used to do it more often, but it used to be I would have a queue like very long, a very long queue, and I didn't like. I feel bad for my guests yeah. to be waiting for more than a quarter. For uh-huh. their real episode. So that's why I minimize it to once a month. And I'm still having, they still are waiting a few months just because depending on what I'm hearing in my community, I may not do two, three guest interviews in a row, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll throw in a solo episode. So really it's what, gu- what guest interviews I already have recorded, <laughs> <laughs> what things have come up in the community and then I take, I started taking breaks. Uh, so I plan for the quarter and then I used to do two week breaks, which I'm like, oh my gosh, that is not enough. And I would do <laughs> replays. And so uh-huh. now this year I started taking a four week, so a month long break and we're not doing replays. We're doing mini episodes, which doesn't take a long to do uh, because that's my audience really crave that. So it's just mm-hmm. basically bet just kind of a recap of that quarter so maybe what the best listeners wins uh the lessons they learned i uh i reach out to a previous guest that they voted on those type of things just to make it fun and i don't spend more than five minutes recording Mm -hmm. that episode and bam (laughs) i love that like it just as i was scrolling through kind of the feed of all the different episodes that you had i Mm -hmm. love the variety yeah, so that's what I do. So I, I'd like to, I in the past, I try to do themes, like monthly mm-hmm. themes. That didn't work out. It would work out for a while, but in planning long term, finding a guest to fit that theme, that was just a headache. So I decided, you know what, let's make it easy and let's just kind of go with the flow. It's maybe not necessarily as structured as I want it to be in terms of uh, one week you get a guest and next week you know you'll be getting me. Not, it doesn't go that way at this mm-hmm. moment in time. <laughs> Keeping it real. That's how it is. I love it. Well, and let, let's go back to community because that's <laughs> one of the things that I love most about podcasting is this feeling of community and, and how we can actually build those. So are is your community mostly on Facebook? Are you on Twitter, Instagram? Like where are you, where is your community hanging out? And then how did you build that community? We've been hanging out on Facebook. I'm really leaning to doing more on Instagram uh, just because I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook. Uh But but at the same time, I do have a Facebook group. So that's where we hang out. And that's where the most interaction takes place Mm -hmm. is in the Facebook group. And how I built it is just basically um, a call to action. Hey, do you want to hang out specifically? It's a group specifically for our listeners, for you, so you can uh, connect where we can learn from each other, where we can grow, where we can motivate each other. So it was just a, a call to uh, call to action and then just a continuous call to action because I've had people, it's an interesting, uh, just because this is how podcasting is, especially if you have a podcast to build your business, it's important to know that any call to actions that you take, that listener may be running and maybe washing the dishes, maybe <laughs> driving. So may, they're not going to take the call to action right away. So I've had people join my community and say, oh, I've been listening for six months. I just got mm-hmm. around to joining, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's really important to think about those things when when you're considering 
starting a podcast for business, that it is for the long haul. It's not a, a, a platform where you just convert right away. Tell us a little bit about your business and how do you actually work with clients? Sure. So I do what's called money coaching. I'm also, uh, I call myself a money confidence coach just because that's came, that title came from my listeners and from my community. Because when I ask them, what do they feel I, they've gotten more, most of? And mm-hmm. yes, they've, they've become better budgeters. They've been able to pay off debt. But the theme that came most was confidence. So I call myself a money confidence coach. I'm also what's called an accredited financial counselor. That's just fancy letters to let you know I've gotten education. I have to maintain my ethics. Uh, I have to continue to get CEUs just so just for peace of mind for someone that wants to work with me. And uh, how I work. So I do one on one coaching I have a membership program as well that I'm actually in the process of relaunching, redoing. Uh, and that's basically, uh, and I recently released a book as well. Oh, yes. We have to talk uh, about the book too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much to cover in this episode. So much to cover. <laughs> but uh, you know, primarily the services I provide is that education component and helping my clients, which is primarily women, uh, get uh, more confident in their finances, establish systems where they're managing their money a lot easier because sometimes money can get complicated. And it's not because mm-hmm. money itself is complicated. is we just make it complicated. Life, what surrounds us, uh, the, our emotions, everything that's around us can make it complicated. And so we help peel those layers. I help peel those layers back to get them to a point where they're confident and they are ready to move forward on their own, where they know they can, they know what they need to do to achieve their financial goals uh, and where we're achieving the, some of their financial goals, depending on what they are in their t- and the time that they work with me. How do you feel that having the podcast has impacted your business? It was the best decision I made. Hands really? Down. Absolutely. Uh, like I mentioned, like I mentioned, I I needed a platform when I started my business. I needed some sort of platform. And I mentioned I tried blogging, completely failed. Uh, YouTube videos, uh, eh, it was all right, but I didn't uh-huh. want to deal with the lighting. And always, I know you can be, you don't have to always look perfect, but I wanted to look presentable. And right. I don't do makeup every day uh-huh. uh, or hardly, not even every week. But uh, so, uh, <laughs> that's so why that's I just, podcast. <laughs> it, right. So I just, and, and I'm good with doing videos without makeup, but sometimes mm-hmm. it's like you want to create that first, that good first impression, right? Uh, so you want to look nice. So that I decided that wasn't for me. But when I did podcasting, the power of podcasting, the power of the voice, how the connection that you can create with your voice, because you can in in writing, you can infuse your personality, but that's, you know, that takes some skill, uh, I think. And in podcasting, I can be goofy. I can, I can just literally, you can be me in all mediums, but Mm -hmm. with podcasting, it's just, they connect with you more. Uh, once a month, I reach out to people on my list who are listeners and all that. And I just, I, I say, hey, let's talk. And uh, when they talk with me, they feel like they already know me, even though I'm like, please tell me about you because you're talking to right. me like we <laughs> know <laughs> exactly. each other, right? So it's yeah. that's the power of podcasting. It creates that special connection. And that definitely has helped in my business because just by them listening to that my episodes on my podcast, it has allowed them to trust me. It has allowed or maybe to say, hey, this is this person's not for me and they'll move on. Right. Mm-hmm. But it, it that's really I think that's that's at the power of podcasting. It allows that person to either connect with you or to know that you're not for them. What I love about your podcast is that your personality just comes right out in the podcast. And it's <laughs> it's fun. And OK, the other thing I love, I don't speak a lick of Spanish, but <laughs> you're like, hey, you're going to you know learn about money and you might pick up some, some Spanish along the way. Claro like, que sí. well, that's fun. <laughs> like, that's cool. And the other thing is, is just listening to you. I know instinctively you're not going to judge me. For my money issues. And I think that that's exactly people are scared about that. Yes. I recently had a person join my community that one of the reasons that they're joining the community, they've been in other 
and I won't mention what other specific money related communities where they felt judged when we when they messed up, right? And yeah. I talk about messing up all the time. I think it's important because who in their right minds is perfect? Right. No one, right? We're all going to goof up with our money at one point in our lives, not even just at one point, at a, <laughs> more than a couple of <laughs> times in our lives, right? <laughs> in different stages in our life. And that's completely okay. And, and in our community, it's, it's welcomed, right? It's, it's, if you goof up, it's, it's okay. It's just a matter of helping you getting back up and moving forward. Not, not, Swallowing, you know, just not uh, well, what is the word where you just continue to wallow in those sorrows of like, oh, I goofed up or I messed up. Oh, my goodness. I failed. No, it's just a matter of like, it is what it is. Let's move on. What do we need to do to move forward? Right. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't um, because I have seen those communities and I won't mention names where it's it is very judgmental. And I'm not about that for sure. How much time are you spending in your Facebook group and and asking questions? Because oh, I know like with some of the bigger groups, with work. some of the bigger groups, it can really it takes a lot of time to really cultivate those relationships. It does. So I have a daily threads Monday through Friday, which are prompts to create that uh to create that conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I have those. And then if I don't see, because Facebook is always changing. Thank you, Facebook. (laughs) Right, (laughs) It's always changing. Uh, So I'm like, huh, I don't know if Facebook's really showing that. I think it's changing in groups because my engagement has been changing and it's been more challenging. So if I don't see that, I pop in. Uh, I just make sure that once they once there's comments that I'm I'm there to uh, to respond to them. I pop. I try and I want to get better in doing more Facebook lives. I've done them, but I haven't been consistent with them. So it it, it is tough. And and it, you do if you decide. And for those considering a Facebook group, it is you have to commit to spending time. It it does take time. It's not easy and uh, you have to just dis- decide if it's for you or not because it is a, it is time consuming. And speaking of time, how much time would you say you're devoting weekly when you are producing your podcasts? I would say when I'm focused because I get <laughs> distracted quite easily. <laughs> when I'm focused for a solo episode, it can take me one to two hours mm-hmm. uh, to like just kind of think, uh, through map it out, uh, record it, that type of thing. Uh, and what I've done, because I do get distracted easily, I've recently, I used to just do it all in one day, like do the mapping out and record it, mm-hmm. but that was just too much. So now I map it out one day and I record it another day. And that just kind of uh, eases my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so for those solo episodes that, and then for my interviews, what I work hard to do um, is that after the interview, because like I said, I do them once a month, I block out time um, that after the interview that I just jot down the main, the um, the best points so I can c- go ahead and create the bullet points mm-hmm. for that. And so I do that. So basically, so maybe one to two tower, two, one to two hours for the solo episode. And if I'm taking about 30 minutes for the interview, let's say. Um, maybe 30 minutes more uh, just to jot down my notes. I would say maybe two hours for this interviews as well. Um, because then once I decide what date they're going, that interview is going to go out, that's when I sit down and actually finish the, because what I do is I do a pre-interview segment and a post-interview segment. And that's when I finish that out and record. So yeah, I would say maybe two hours. And that's not including editing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Exactly. Or the show notes. Jen, tell us about your new book. Well, my book is called Her Money Matters, The Missing Truths from Traditional Money Advice. And it's interesting we're talking about podcasting because the book came as a result of my podcast. I wondered about that. Yes, yes. And again, consistency, right? Uh-huh. So that's why I'm so glad I do podcasting. <laughs> so I was contacted by a traditional publisher over a year ago and about it. he loved what he saw. And I was like, did he realize I'm a podcaster? Because uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> he saw the show notes. Okay, perfect. And he's because basically he asked me, he loved what he saw. Would I be willing to write a book? And literally just as a replica of my blog. 
And I'm really? like, did he see? Yes. So I'm like, did he see that I was a podcaster? So <laughs> at my first in- instinct was like thinking, yeah, did he see what I was a podcaster? Or the second thing was fear because I'm like, oh my gosh, this, I don't know if this is for me. And the third thing, it wasn't even on my uh, bucket list. I know a lot of people have books on their bucket list and I'm that mm-hmm. rebel. If someone wants to do it, I don't want to do it because uh-huh. <laughs> it seems like everybody wants to do it, right? That's yeah. just how I think naturally. I'm being real. And then after some thought, I'm like, you know what? This doesn't happen frequently, right? Mm-hmm. So just buckle up. Let's do this. Uh, it could be a good thing. And I buckled up and uh, wrote the book. And it was definitely a great decision as well, just because it, it gave me more clarity as to why my philosophies around money, why I teach what I teach. Mm-hmm. It gave me more cl- being, being able to put down my journey of money in a book was was awesome, too. And um, so that was fantastic. But was an interesting thing that happened is I started out with a traditional publisher, but then I ended up self-publishing and it's all really? because we, yes, because we weren't, weren't able to come to terms on the book cover, book mm-hmm. publishers and he, very, very nice book uh, publishing company, but they had their own vision of a book cover and I had mine. And even though I promise you, I'm a team player. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you I am. I really had to stand confident and proud about my the book, right? And when you and I knew I had to sell the book. Book publishers, they maybe they market your book sometimes uh, to a point, but at the end the author is the one responsible for selling the book. So I knew I had to be able to be proud and show that book to, you know, if I was Instagramming or whatever you want to do on right. social media, I had to stand proud and I didn't want I wanted the book to be welcoming to, to women. That's something that would be fun for them to pick up, right? Mm-hmm. And so I decided it, we we cut the cord and uh, moved on to self-publishing, which that was a difficult decision to do because in traditional publishing, they take care of everything for you, right? Mm-hmm. You would just have to write the book. You, there's some limitations there, you know, pros and cons. In self-publishing, I had to take care of everything myself in terms of finding the editor, finding a book cover designer and and pay out of pocket, right? So right, yeah. in traditional book publishing, they take care of that. You don't get paid much per book. In self-publishing, you pay up front and then you pay, you know, you get more of those uh, royalties, right? Mm-hmm. And I went on a tangent, so I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, that's great. What What would you say was your biggest takeaway of learning from doing this whole self-publishing journey? I think the biggest takeaway was really to embrace, I mean, not being true to you, uh, which is what I did, right? Um, Making sure that, you know what, I wasn't the book cover they wanted, the traditional publisher wanted to provide didn't really resonate with me. It didn't feel mm-hmm. good for me. And then in self-publishing, I was told, you need to do this this way. You need to do this this way. And I just stayed true to me. Uh, and I think that worked for, well for me. So it's being is not being afraid of doing trusting your instincts. Mm-hmm. Is uh, my my learnings from this, uh, and because I know you're you have a book launch team, which I did, and some people are like, no, don't do applications, make it easy for them. I'm like, I did applications, I had my reasonings for, uh-huh. for that, and 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 uh, so it was it was just doing it my way. And sometimes I did some things that I hadn't seen done before in terms of mm-hmm. like when we were doing the book launch. Uh, what I I wanted to make sure that I took care of my launch team uh, members, those type of things. So it was just really being true to me and doing it my way. I love it. And I have to ask, is there going to be an audio book version? There is, because I've been asked. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to figure out when to do it, because that's the other thing. That's the time commitment, right? So do I, A, want to... um, go into a a closet full of clothes and uh, because the audio quality I've learned with, for example, for Audible, for an audio book, it has to be better than a podcast. Yes. is And so therefore what I'd have to either A, uh, go into a closet full of clothes and just 
record maybe one chapter or two chapters at a time, right? Uh, and hope that that sound is the best or B, invest and go into a studio where then the the con there is I'd have to sit and do it in one sitting. And I don't know if I can do that. Like I have a short attention span <laughs> sitting down for six to eight hours. That's going to be difficult for me. So I haven't moved forward with that because I'm like, I don't know how I want to move forward with that. But yes, there's an audio uh, book. I pulled my audience and I did uh, one of the episodes prior to the book launch. It was my uh, audition. <laughs> Uh-huh. for them. <laughs> so I audition. I'm like, okay, I'm going to read a chapter. Uh, so you let me know, do I do this, you know, myself, because I have been asked, when is the audio version going to be available? Or should I outsource this? And of course, I should have known the answer was like, of course, you do it. <laughs> right. I hear it from you. So yes, there's going to be an audio version. I don't know when. I have a client that did that exact thing. She recorded her book in her walk-in closet. Mm. It turned out great. I might do that. I think that's that, that's where I'm leaning more towards to just because I can, the flexibility of being able to do a chapter or two here and mm -hmm. because I, I don't know if I can sit six to eight hours or whatever, it however long it takes me. I might not, it might not be as good of an audiobook if I'm able to do it on my own terms in terms of just doing a, a couple chapters here where I have my energy levels versus six to eight hours where my energy levels might not be consistent. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of sitting down, like mindset and energy level mm -hmm. and all of that stuff plays su such a big part in that and how you come across. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited for the uh, audio book version to come out. Oh, I am so too. And I'm glad you mentioned it because I'm like... <laughs> I need to get that on my schedule. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. So how have you been promoting the book? I know you mentioned you've got a book launch team. How, what, does, what does that look like? Once you get the book written and it's published, then what happens? How do you get that out to the world? All right. So I, I actually, um, as I was pre uh, prepping, as my book was being edited, I was planning the, the book launch. How how was my book launch going to look like? So I took a try. I don't know if you're familiar with Trello. I mm -hmm. did a Trello board of different, you know, from the month where I was at uh, when we started the, um, the editing to when we wanted to launch the book. And what would my ideal book launch look like? So I started mm -hmm. with my ideal. And of course, my ideal want, had me going on TV and radio and all that stuff. Uh huh. And so that was my ideal book launch. And then from there, I looked, had to look at my time, the clients that I was serving, uh, my time commitments that I already mm -hmm. had, and what was realistic, what could I actually do with the time that I had, right? Uh, so then I was like, well, maybe TV is not for me, especially if I hadn't done TV yet, right? Uh, uh -huh. So maybe it doesn't make sense. So I decided I focused on what I do, podcasting. So I hired someone to help me get me on some podcasts, even though I know podcasters, I knew my time was limited. Mm -hmm. And I knew, knew myself that maybe I would reach out to uh, friends and that are podcasters and get myself some on some podcasts. But I didn't have the time to reach out to other podcasts. So I outsourced that for her to help me. And she's fantastic. And so my marketing plan was literally podcast interviews. And then my book launch team as well, they helped as well. And I did a early release uh, notification. So mm -hmm. it was building my list that way, as well as I, I did some pre launch episodes. So it was basically giving them little glimpses into the book. And I did it I call it uh, a la Amy Porterfield style uh -huh. because I had downloads for those episodes. And uh, so those went did really, really well because people loved people love worksheets, especially in my audience. That's why in my book, I also have worksheets and a companion workbook, because that was like a that was a request and in high I request love that I actually just did that for an episode. Uh, did you? Yeah, for one of my tutorial videos, I was like, what's the point of putting all of this out here and asking people to do stuff if you don't give them a place to write it down? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Love that. I do. I'm a fan of a workbook. 
Oh, I love, and my audience loves worksheets, and I do like creating them. So uh -huh. um, <laughs> they're a luck because I do. It, it's it's one of the things that I enjoy doing. That's great, and I I love that you mentioned Trello too because that is one of my favorite go to tools for just trying to keep myself focused in podcast production and working with multiple clients. I can always go back to that and look at where I'm supposed to be and what exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Right, right, right. No, Trello is a great tool. Mm -hmm. What's what's next, Jen? <laughs> next, I think, is the audio book because I'm like, oh, my goodness, I didn't put that in my quarter two planning. <laughs> 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 I realized that when you said that, oh, fail, <laughs> I failed right there. But no, the audio book, uh, for sure. And I've been focusing on doing a more local events, so local workshops, because I've during the, my time in business, I was focused so much on online marketing and there's really no more power than having meeting that person in the flesh, right? And it does make a world of a difference. So I've been focused more on building my business locally as well. Uh, so those things and just continuing to get my book out there and, you know, my really my longer term or shorter term goal or midterm goal, whatever you want to call it, because I don't have a, I'll be honest, there's no plan in place for that is really to get myself uh, more into paid speaking. Mm -hmm. I've done speaking, um, but I haven't done the paid speaking. Uh, and I'm, of course, with a book that gives me that opportunity, it gives me that leverage to be able to do that. Oh, definitely. So that's something that I like to do as well. And where can people find this fabulous book? They can go to Amazon and just search Her Money Matters, or you can go to this link, jenhemphill.com forward slash book. Uh, and it just tells you a little bit about, about the book and you click on the button and it takes you straight to Amazon where the book, where the book is at. Fantastic. And then to find out more about you and to listen to the podcast, where, where do we need to send the fine people? just to jenhemphill.com. Everything you need to know is right there. Fantastic. Jen, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I hope this conversation fired up some ideas for how you might use podcasting in your own business. I wanted to highlight a few key podcasting gems of wisdom that Jen shared. It can be challenging to produce a sustainable podcast. It's going to cost you either time or money, and sometimes both. Committing to outsourcing the tasks that Jen knew she didn't want to do before she launched was smart. Maybe you aren't in a position yet where you can outsource any of the tasks. That's okay. It's good experience to know how to do every step of the production process. Doing the work will help you determine which tasks would be best for you to delegate down the road. And so what I decided to do before I committed, I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I know myself, I didn't want to do the editing because again, my perfectionism comes into play and I didn't want to spend four, five, six hours editing one episode. So right off the bat, bat I made the commitment that if I was going to do podcasting, that I was going to commit to outsourcing the editing piece. So that was very, very important to me. I'm so happy that Jen talks about podcasting being a long game. It takes a while for people to get to know you and to engage. That listener may be running and maybe washing the dishes, maybe driving. So may, they're not going to take the call to action right away. So I've had people join my community and say, oh, I've been listening for six months. I just got around to joining, right? <laughs> so it's really important to think about those things when, when you're considering starting a podcast for business, that it is for the long haul. It's not a, a, a platform where you just convert right away. Our voices are a powerful tool for creating connection. Your audience can really get to know you and your working style from listening to your show. And it's okay if they listen to your show and determine that you aren't a good fit because they might not have been a good fit for you. That's the power of podcasting. It creates that special connection. And that definitely has helped in my business because just by them listening to the, my episodes on my podcast, it has allowed them to trust me. It has allowed them, or maybe to say, hey, this is this person's not for me and they'll move on. Right. But it, it, that's really I think that's 
it's at the power of podcasting. It allows that person to either connect with you or to know that you're not for them. Promoting her new book by focusing on being a guest on podcast was super smart because that way Jen could target shows that already had a built-in audience of people that would likely be interested in reading her book. So I decided I focused on what I do, podcasting. So I hired someone to help me get me on some podcasts. Even though I know podcasters, I knew my time was limited and I knew myself that maybe I would reach out to uh, friends and that are podcasters and get myself some on some podcasts, but I didn't have the time to reach out to other podcasts. So I outsourced that for her to help me and she's fantastic. And so my marketing plan was literally podcast interviews. And then my book launch team as well. They helped as well. I hope this series is shining some light on the variety of ways you can leverage your voice to grow your audience and your business. Visit BrassyBroad.com for more podcasting resources and tutorials. And if you're ready for the real thing, schedule a workshop session with me. We'll roll up our sleeves and work hands-on through your podcasting questions and challenges. Thanks for listening. Now get out in the world and do some good. Good.